Amen. And God's uh, still doing a grace in me and in every one of us. Uh, the message I'm, I'm going to give you today is, is going to be two parts. At the beginning, I'm going to be sharing uh, about our, our recent journey uh, to the Baltic and then leading from there and the care that we give there to care for our world and, and everyone in it. The scriptures that I want to share with you are taken from uh, 1 Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it and all in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. And then from Proverbs 24, same, uh, both 20, chapters 24 in Proverbs and Psalms. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Yeah, so we made another trip to the Baltic. Uh, we just can't seem to stay away, uh, which includes the three countries you see there, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And um, people say why they call it the Baltic, because it's on the Baltic Sea. But the door opened for us in June to connect with about eight churches and four other ministries, and so we felt like we really needed to be there. I want to say that I am very grateful for the prayers and the support that you give to this work. Uh, the men in this past year have given gifts uh, for this ministry, and um, I thank you very much. And uh, what a joy we had back in July to introduce Egli to you, but that was actually at the 830 service because we couldn't be here at 11, but she was the administrative secretary in Lithuania, and she's done that for 27 years, and she's my translator. Uh, but we, in June, on June 12th, we landed in Tallinn, uh, the capital uh, of Estonia, and our first connection was the Baltic Methodist Theological Seminary, which was celebrating 30 years of ministry. And they've educated hundreds of leaders and have really impacted uh, that part of the world. Uh, I met with the trustees, uh, I, we celebrated 30 years, and then we had the graduation. And as we were at the celebration, and we were talking about people who impacted the seminary, my mind went back to Bill Quick, who spoke here, to Eddie Fox, who spoke here, who were very involved in those countries and doing ministry, and then also Jack Harnish. Uh, Bill and Eddie have gone to be with the Lord, but Jack is still living. But Jack invited me to be a trustee over there. So that's how we got involved in this, in this journey. But never forget that we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. So the seminary keeps training pastors. Their vision is those who have a Wesleyan Methodist heritage. But we're getting students from every background, independent, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, you know, all over and, and reaching students from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Finland, and students are now coming from Africa. And you know, when the war broke out, it was hot potatoes, you know, between the Ukrainians and the Russians and those from Belarus. But they came to see that, that they are part of a, a greater holy nation in Christ, as 1 Peter 2.9 says, greater than anything in this world. And so they, they learn to get along. But people keep saying, well, why this part of the world? And, and one of the first reasons is, is, is that very few people there know Christ. And I take crosses over there, and I, I've given out hundreds of crosses. And I get to talk to people about what Jesus has done, but only two or three percent of people go to church or really know Jesus. So it's one of the biggest mission fields in the world. And I guess Carol and I are your missionaries. Uh, so we continue to be part of this. And Jesus said we're to go into all the world, make disciples. And uh, I hope someday that maybe a person or two can get over there with us for the right project. Now, Estonia has 26 churches. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the mission committee for their support of the Hopsalu Church, uh, where we have visited, and there's a picture of me preaching in June, uh, and uh, the pastor there that served was here was Ormas. I was always calling him Ermas. And I met this lady in Midland from Estonia, and she said, 
It's not Ermos. It's Ormos. So I went back and I said to him, I said, Ermos, all this time I've been saying your name wrong. He says, oh, John, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but we Skype all the time, and so we, are, we really stay connected. But Ormos, the retired pastor who lives in the church, church mouse, the other pastor is Rauno Oyaso. He and Ermos are very grateful for your gifts. We were encouraged because we met uh, Guido. Guido, you know, it's kind of Italian, right? But anyways, he's a new member of the church. He was baptized. He's come to believe in Jesus. So we were really encouraged by that. Uh, but one of the greatest needs is for pastors to have them and for them to have support. And the average income in the Baltic is like 18,000 euros, which is just about $18,000. And then the government takes 38%. Who here wants to live on that? And so pastors even make less. So giving that support makes a big difference. So after Estonia, we traveled to Latvia, uh, the second brown country there just above the white Lithuania. And um, there are about 10 Methodist-related churches there which we work with. And uh, in addition to the churches, they have a camp there called Camp Wesley. And they're reaching children for Christ. Uh, and the director is, you can see her there, is Anita Erkuma. And she's been at the seminary also. But what a great thing to be connected to a camp that's reaching children for, for Christ in a country where very few people know him. Uh, another place we went to was the Hope Center right after that. And this lady here, Gita Benani, she's a connector. She really gets us involved in the ministry there they had their 20th anniversary of the hope center which ministers to women in crisis and they've reached hundreds of women in the last 20 years and without the center uh, these women wouldn't have a place to stay and there you can see the picture of some of them with their with their children and last year uh the flushing church gave hats and mittens and socks and scarves and all that kind of thing and and we're we are uh, we're, I'll tell you later, we're going back again, and if you want to help in any way, let us know. Uh, but near this, uh, where the Hope Center is, is the town of Sessus, and that's where a lot of refugees are. In two, 2022, we met with two refugee families, and in 2023, we met with nine refugee families from Ukraine, and in 2024, this June... It snowballed, and we met with 27 refugee families. We, we, and uh, and I, I think the reason that this snowballs, this lady right here, Natalie Galay, that's her son, Vladislav, Carol and I, he needed surgery, and uh, he, he had a bad blood vessel in his leg, and they didn't have the money and she, oh, she was so thorough. She sent me the hospital bill, everything under the sun. But this church raised money for that. And the Flushing Church, between the two of you, God bless you. She was so elated. I think she told everybody uh, to uh, come out. And she gave us this, uh, this Ukrainian flag. I think I'm going to give this to the church and, and, um, t as a way of thank you. And so we heard stories of, of uh, husbands who've died, people fled with just the clothes on their back. And, and I know the, the immigration situation is tough here and it's many needs there, but I'm telling you, uh, it, it's just absolutely uh, 38 million people are being bombed, shot, destroyed. It, it's just awful. And uh, so these people uh, need a, a place uh, to stay, they need support. Um, and you might not be aware of this, but Russia comes in, takes the children away from their homes and takes them back to Russia. They do it with families. They, they're just trying to strip them of their uh, national heritage, make them speak Russian, and, and it's, just, it's just horrendous. So we must care for the suffering in God's world. 
and the Estonian and the Latvian and Lithuanian churches, some of them disaffiliated, but some of them still UMC, are helping with thousands of refugees. And our churches in Poland are doing incredible things. And uh, I got to tell you, there, there's not much, there has almost, I don't know if there's ever been such a welcoming in, as Poland has made of almost 4 million uh, people that, that are refugees. God bless them. But it's in our hearts, friends, to make a difference in the world. The, the other reason we care is that the people there have suffered under communism and Stalin, under Hitler and Nazi Germany. And, and it's with them. They all have friends and family that have suffered. And now they're under the threat of Russian attack again. The Bible says if we see people being led to the slaughter and do not do anything, God will hold us accountable. 600,000 people and more have died. Some are saying that World War III has already started. It's just that we don't have the, the troops involved. And again, the scripture says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering to slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they've done? I've always said, if I lived in Germany during the Nazi regime, I, I hope I would have spoken out and not been silent. And I don't want to be silent about any injustice in the world. And we tend to focus on certain justice issues, but there are other ones in the world we're not even aware of. I read this week that the U.S. is moving tanks to the Polish border to ramp up protection. And we have troops there. Do you know how far it is from the Russian border to Alaska? In the Bering Strait? It's 55 miles, about an hour. And I'm not, I'm not, my intention is not to, to, to scare you or, or to stir up whatever, but it's known that Putin has missiles aimed at European cities. They're already aimed. And they're aimed at us. And we need to really be in prayer for the whole world, for these suffering people. I have 25 emails of these Ukrainian families, and I just, I'm not sure what to do with that. I feel like we could start a church over there, but God cares about them. Well, after five days in Estonia, five days in Latvia, we headed to Pilvishke, Lithuania, where we've been serving churches there. And the reason we're serving is they don't have a pastor. This is their church. This was built by the Nina uh, UMC and another church in Wisconsin. Uh, the Sunday we were there, we had 35 people in worship, which was just wonderful. We had Bible study, and one of the greatest joys is that four young adults came back that grew up in that church and helped with the translating, working with children. And one of them, there's a Bible study, one of them, Vitalia, I'm now talking with her on WhatsApp, she feels a call into the ministry, and, and I'm sending a study and prayer guide for their Sunday worship every week. And she's now going to be with them. And that's a great hallelujah. The door could open there for ministry. Now let me conclude this segment of the message by telling you that we're going back again. <laughs> uh, you know, most of you, that we have a, a daughter and son-in-law who are in Kyrgyzstan. And they're doing mission work there. And our grandbaby, Rua Joy, is there. And that's... Bethany with Tyler, Natalie, and Rua Joy. And K Carolyn said, we have to go see the baby. <laughs> I said, I want to see the baby too. But can't we wait till the spring? No, I got to see the baby this year. Okay. So we're going to see the baby. And Natalie and Tyler too. But the plane is going over Lithuania. So we're stopping in Lithuania. Going to preach two times, do a Bible study, trying to help set them up with a TV, a laptop, and Wi-Fi so that we can Zoom services to them. A lot of moving parts here, but this is what we're trying to do. And then we're going to get to Kyrgyzstan, and we're going to visit the, we're going to visit the Bishkek Methodist Church, too. And I know Tyler and Natalie are going to have us involved uh, in some way in their ministry. So we are to be in the world speaking up for truth, standing for justice, helping the brokenhearted, 
and not ignoring the suffering of millions of people. Now I want to segue in, into another part of this message. Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and establishes it on the waters. Say this with me. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. And all that live in it. It's not mine. It's not yours. But friends, we're not taking care of God's world. A man who mentored me in my doctor of ministry, Howard Snyder, wrote a book entitled Creation Healed. In it, he describes that not only are we to care for the well-being, that's Howard, and salvation of all people, but we are to also take care of the physical earth God's given us. Do you ever stop and think that your house belongs to God? Your property belongs to God? Your body belongs to God? If you don't think that's true, when you leave this earth, it's staying here. And your body belongs to God. But we forget God owns it all. And I look around, I see a mentality where it's okay to trash the world and it's okay to trash people. Everything we have now is throwaway. It didn't used to be that way. When I grew up as a boy, I'd go with my dad to the Amish farms and they canned things in jars. They threw their garbage in the compost. They put the paper and cardboard in the furnace to burn. Have you noticed how big trash barrels are today? Oh, huge. They're kind of nifty, but... The head of waste management, the world's largest trash company, estimates that 20 billion is buried annually in 1,900 U.S. landfills. That's a lot of trash. And they estimate that a lot of it has some value. New York spends 300 million to transport 12,000 tons of garbage a day. There you can see it going right by the Statue of Liberty. We have become polluters and consumers. And do you know what's going on in our oceans? 12 million tons of plastic goes there every year. It's as big as a continent. You know, we talk about global warming, and I care about that too, but we are choking the planet right now. Fish are eating this stuff, thinking it's food. It's going into our lakes, it's into our fish, it's in our bodies. It's running off the particles from the clothes that are plastic, polyester, whatever. It's killing us with air pollution, ground pollution, and plastic pollution. Our cancer rates are some of the highest in the world. But when I tell people like some of this stuff, it's like a deer in the headlights. Well, pastor, we didn't know you're such an ecologist and tree hugger. But you know what? I think God's put it in my heart because this is God's world and I can't trash it. And this is not just the latest social justice fad. Do you remember the story in the Gospels where Jesus multiplied the fish and loaves after they gathered it up? He said, don't waste anything. And in the Old Testament, they left grain in the food, field for the poor and for the animals. God cares for the world and all of the people in it and we are too. And so I can't throw away food because I know that others are hungry. You know, there was the old joke mom said to the child, you eat your, you eat your beans because children in Africa are starving. And the little boy says, well, me eating these beans is not going to help the children in Africa. But they're missing a point. If you eat and don't waste, you'll have more money to give to others. Listen to this. In America, 2.5 billion tons of food is thrown away. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of food. That's got to be $100 billion worth. we got to figure out how to share our abundance with others. Jesus said, don't waste anything. But I think our callous attitude towards the earth and all the resources God has given us has spread over into how we relate to people. We trash the world, but we're trashing people. Our news, news stations spend most of their time trashing the other side. The news is secondary. 
How many remember the days of Walter Cronkite? You just got the news. And sadly, this has spilled over into social media. People are so mean and outspoken that it takes your breath away. And people feel like they can say anything because they're not face to face. And Christians have fallen this mean-spiritedness. The scripture says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only that which edifies or encourages others. There's a movement started by Will Bowen who wrote a book called Complaint Free World. Anybody heard of that book? Complaint Free World? See, we, we got a lot of work to do because there's a lot of good things going on in the world that we could be part of. But 15 million people have read it and have taken the challenge. Uh, you get this bracelet that you can see up there, this purple bracelet, and you go through the day without a complaint. If you make a complaint, you snap yourself. I'm ordering some. I'm ordering some. We're going to get everybody who wants one, okay? One guy said, it saved, the 21-day challenge, he said, it saved my marriage. Another guy said, I have 27 employees and it changed the whole company. If you're going to be in his company, you have to do the complaint-free challenge for 21 days. So God has called us to care for our world, which is his world. And God has called us to care for one another, to love people in this country and in around the world who are suffering and struggling. We are to cherish human life because everyone is created in God's image. Would you say that with me? Everyone is created in God's image. And we have a ways to go. We've got to give grace to people who are different than we are. And we make judgments when we don't know the whole story. And I want to just talk about a couple things that sometimes it's hard to address. One of my greatest burdens is for people who are in care facilities. I believe this church has a good care and respect for the elderly. And a number of you will go see Anna Boyd. But there are millions of people in care facilities who feel cast away. And statistics show that 90% of them are understaffed. And it's been my experience that very few Christians go and visit. I know many of you do, but it should be the duty of all of us because Jesus said in the final judgments there's going to be goats and sheep. And the goats are going to be those who didn't visit or care or reach out to those alone, the sick, whatever, and the, the sheep are going to be those who did it. That's pretty serious. And Jesus said when you did it to them, you did it to me, and if you didn't do it, you, you missed out on loving me. Someone told me the other day that when they go and see their loved one, they walk through the care facility and they just say hi and they tap them on the shoulder and hi, tap them on the shoulder and hi, tap them on the shoulder. Do you know how much a tap on the shoulder means to somebody in a situation like that? That can make their day. We've fallen into the trap of neglecting people who Jesus says are precious. You know, a number of years ago, we were appalled that China was doing forced abortions on countless millions of people. And, and some of the people were throwing their babies in the rock, down in the rocks in the ocean. And there were articles on that. Their one-child policy. They now scaled back on that because they're losing population. But I believe that the world... You may disagree with me, that's fine, we could talk about it, I'd like to pray about it, has become callous to little children in the womb. In the world, there are 50 million abortions worldwide. If you multiply that by 52, going back to about 1972, what do you think that comes to? 2.6 billion. When I was in college, it started and people said, oh, you know, this is for rape and incest. This is just a few people are in trouble. We want to give them an out. It's taken that number as one third of today's present population. I fear we've become callous to human life. The word of God says in Psalm 139, 14, that we were created by God, fashioned in our mother's womb. 
And I want to say this. We need to care deeply about women who face rape and incest. And we need to support them and bless them and build them up. But I'm sorry. Some people skew the statistics, but we're looking at less than 1,000% of the total being rape and incest. And we should work for the co- to stop the causes of rape, too. And we should be compassionate to women who have had an abortion, who struggle with it, because it's our society that's pushed it so hard. And I think we've been deceived. And I hope that as a church, uh, we can continue to support pregnancy resource centers that provide an alternative to, to support women in crisis. So church, let's have a heart of compassion for all people. Those dying in Israel, those dying in Ukraine, those displaced, those who are alone, little children don't have enough to eat, precious children in the womb. And let's not trash people who think differently than us, but work to bring Jesus' forgiveness and salvation to every single human being in this world. And may we also care for the world that God has given us, for it belongs to Him. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all who dwell in it. Amen.